kind of a repeat. I've got a Miami University tie on today. Um, Fran and I both graduated from Miami. Uh, our son Pat and daughter Jill were actually born when we were students there. Uh, John and Alice also graduated from Miami, and uh, our son-in-law Bill did as well. Uh, I'm wearing it because uh, this weekend we have three of our grandsons who are graduating from uh, Miami University, uh, David, Matthew, and Jacob, uh, and so we congratulate them. Uh, our granddaughter Grace is also finishing up her first year uh, at Miami University, and our grandson Brian will be starting there uh, in, in the fall. Well, today, um, as everyone knows, all retail is, is back open. And um, we got some great pictures. Uh, John and uh, Carol's uh, comic book shop in Cleveland. Carol and John's comic book shop in Cleveland. Uh, actually, I think it's in Camp's Corner. Uh, to be specific, I sent some pictures to show what they have done to help get ready for opening their store uh, today to customers. They've installed a barrier at the checkout, and you can see the hand sanitizer with Baby Yoga, uh, Yoda on Baby Yoda on the left of the photo. Okay, well there, all right, this look, looks good. Uh, staff will also be wearing face coverings. They're recommending that their customers wear masks and will have disposable masks available for customers. Uh, for the at-risk members of our community, those 65 and older, uh, they had a local seamstress, seamstress make up Marvel mask that they will give customers for free. That is really cool. Uh, they have put up distance markers six feet apart. Uh, in the shop to help customers gauge their space from each other. And they've established uh, their max COVID-19 occupancy as 15 plus staff. And when you enter the shop, you'll see a hand sanitizer station that looks like that. Uh, they're restocking it with hand sanitizer made locally at the Western Reserve Distillers in Lakewood. Uh, employees will be sanitizing their hands regularly throughout the day. Uh, they will also be wiping down high traffic areas hourly. Employees will also be doing an assessment of themselves daily to determine if they are fit for duty. If they're sick, they will stay home. Carol and John's comic book shop is excited to open. Uh, we thank them for sharing their fun story uh, with us and adding a little bit of fun and pop culture to the COVID-19 uh, precautions. So thank you very, very much. Uh, one final thing, they also have a shrine to the Back to the Future movies in their shop, uh, complete with a flux capacitor. Those of you who have watched the movies know what that is. Uh, awesome. I look forward to uh, visiting them some, sometime in, in, in the future. Our Ohio Department of Jobs and Family Services just received notice that our pandemic EBT plan, uh, electronic benefit transfer plan, was approved by the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, the pandemic EBT program was included in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act of 2020. This approval will allow uh, Jobs and Family Services to distribute SNAP benefits to help 850,000 students across Ohio. These are children who relied on free or reduced price meal programs when school was physically in session. Uh, that gave them a hot, nutritious meal. The benefits will be mailed directly out and families don't need to apply, do not need to apply to be eligible. So those will be mailed out. Uh, families will receive around $300 to purchase healthy and nutritious foods to feed the children. Uh, these benefits amount to more than $250 million that will go to our grocery stores and other eligible retailers. So that is very, very good news. May is Older Americans Month. And so today, uh, we're going to spend most of our time talking about older Americans. Um, we will have joining us in a moment uh, both Marine Corcoran, our director of the Department of Medicaid and 
Ursel McElroy, who's our director of the Department of, of Aging. Um, early on, I tasked uh, Director Corcoran, uh, who is a nurse, by the way, uh, but I asked her, in addition to her duties in regard to Medicaid, uh, to oversee our testing operations in our congregate living settings and, and basically uh, to work with these nursing homes uh, and other congregate care living around the state of Ohio and to come up with an overall plan. Uh, so she's been working uh, in regard to this for some time. Uh, we have a plan in place, uh, and she's going to talk about that, that plan that has been in place. Um, she and Dr. Acton and our whole team have really done some innovative work in regard to our nursing homes. Uh, we created an innovative Ohio plan, which I think is really unique uh, across our, our country. Uh, we divide the state up by hospital zones. Uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, and we've mentioned before when we actually unveiled this plan, um, what we want and what we have now is where ev every hospital takes on some nursing homes. And so every nursing home has a hospital uh, to, to work with them in case there's a, a COVID-19 outbreak in the nursing home. Uh, from the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, we've been focused on testing those who are most in need of tests. I want to thank our hospital for stepping up in regard to helping the nursing homes do this. Uh, it has helped us uh, really to put us ahead of the curve as we have flattened the curve as well. Um, so I've asked uh, the director, uh, Director Corcoran, to uh, explain the, the program. And so, but before I do that, uh, let me turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor and then to Dr. Acton, and then we'll go to the director. Great. Thank you very much, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to just go through some uh, work groups and some opening announcements that uh, have come uh, through the work uh, of, of those particular groups. We know that on May the 15th, outdoor restaurant services will be reopening under the protocols uh, established by the restaurant group. Personal services will also open uh, under the protocols that were developed by that group. That included best practices for hair salons, day spas, nail salons, barbershops, and tanning services. Unaddressed uh, at that time under personal services were massage and tattoos and piercings because they were regulated differently respectively by the Medical Board and the Ohio Department of Health. Uh, those issues have been resolved. There is agreement on what the protocols should be, and both of those services will be allowed to reopen with proper, proper safety protocols on May the 15th, uh, along with the other personal services. So re let me repeat that the massage and tattoo uh, piercing issues have been resolved by the respective regulatory agencies, and... Um, they will be allowed to reopen on May the 15th. All of the details for those particular protocols for operation will be available at coronavirus.ohio.gov under the Responsible Restart tab. If they're not there now, they should be there by 4 p.m. this afternoon. Uh, additionally, uh, reviews are underway in the key work groups that we talked about, travel and tourism, casinos and racinos, but also want to mention that we are, we are working as quickly as we can on fairs, outdoor recreation, uh, camping and sports and the like, and gyms and fitness, because we know that these are time-sensitive issues with Ohioans trying to make plans for their summer uh, and make plans with their children as well. And just a reminder on all of these particular issues, as we've said from the very beginning, all reopenings, all reopenings, must meet the minimum standards. We've established those minimum standards, but many businesses will add best practices, may ask you to wear a mask. They, many of them will be promoting higher standards uh, in their facilities. Uh, and remember also that just because you can open doesn't mean every business will open on those dates. You should check with them uh, before you head out to make sure uh, about what the rules for their services might be. 
Uh, recall also that once we get to Friday, around 90 plus percent of the Ohio economy will be open. Uh, and I want to reiterate again, we said this from the very beginning, if you're a local health department or a mayor or, uh, and you have concerns about either the pace of the openings or the standards, you can delay those openings or increase the requirements. You have that local authority to do that if there's a concern that you have. So you can go higher standards and later, uh, but you can't go lower standards and earlier. Uh, and that's the general philosophy that we followed throughout the process. And a reminder, final reminder, respect the employees who are working in these facilities. Uh, remember, they have families too, and we have, a, we have an obligation to keep each other safe. So thank you very much, and uh, turn it back over to, uh, I guess, Dr. Dr. Acton. All right. <laughs> thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, a look at our numbers today. We have confirmed 25,000 250 cases in Ohio. That is up 473 from yesterday. Um, now we have 1,436 Ohioans who have been lost to COVID-19. Um, that was 79 deaths um, reported since yesterday. Uh, next slide. Again, we have this age range going up to 108 now. And our number is still skewing toward the uh, male, actually, with 54% of our cases being male. Uh, next slide. Trends, again, we're keeping those 21-day trends for you. So much more data like this on our website for you to take a look at. We see the ups and downs, um, but overall, still in a very flat plateau phase. Next slide. And again, our testing numbers going up. Sometimes we'll see some decreases on a day or two over the weekend, Governor. Sometimes we see a few less tests, but um, we're still moving upwards in that area. I want to also share, because we're going to talk a little bit today about nursing homes. Um, we now know that, um, of course, most of our testing has gone to high-risk situations, hospitals, frontline workers, and, of course, nursing homes. Uh, Long-term care residents make up 16% of the cases that we just shared with you, and they make up, in our state, 22% of the deaths that we see. Um, obviously, um, this is an issue we worry about. I want to say something really important here. We started a new process um, during this. It was data we never collected before on the deaths and more data on long-term care facilities. I want to say that you know one of the most important things that has been asked by CMS, and we certainly do in our state, is ask that nursing homes talk with family members whenever they have a case or an outbreak. It doesn't mean necessarily that a nursing home has done something wrong. This is a very contagious disease, obviously a very deadly disease, and it getting in a nursing home, even in the best of practices, can happen. I think that's really important to say. Um, what's most important is that we're transparent and let you know that, and then we handle that outbreak very effectively. That's one of the things that uh, Director Corcoran will be talking to you about next. But you know, one of the things we realized is this would be a high-risk population for us. And in Ohio, we've been working tirelessly on making nursing homes safe from the very beginning. But I want to say to the workers out there, I've said this before, the workers who work every day to help, it's one of the most painful parts of this pandemic for many of us is having relatives and people we love that we can't go visit. We've had to limit some of the things we normally do. And that is you know, tragic at the same time trying to protect uh, the people we love. So I, d I just want to acknowledge that. And you know, a nursing home shouldn't be ashamed to have a case. The number one thing for a nursing home, for any of our businesses who are opening up again, I say to you, like the lovely business we just saw, ask for help if you start to see something that just doesn't feel right, whether it's in a prison, whether it's in a homeless shelter, whether it's in a business. Call your local health department. We stand ready to help talk you through it. We'll bring in the best experts we can to help you figure out the best solutions. It really is going to take all of us. Um, I just want to share with you um, a quote um, from Peggy Noonan. It was an article she had written in the Wall Street Journal this past weekend. We have to cooperate by doing the things that contain the illness so that our businesses can stay open and keep functioning. 
wearing a mask isn't a sign of submission, as some have said. It's really a sign of respect, responsibility, and economic encouragement. It says, I'll do my small part. So it really is a safety we're doing as we go about not only to keep ourselves safe, keep others safe, but really help the most amazing small business. These businesses, especially these small businesses, are our babies. They're our children. They're our act of creation. And it really is what we can do uh, to keep this economy open and to keep those people who are really doing everything they can to stay open safe. So once again, uh, don your mask, don your cape, and let's help um, these Cape Crusaders we saw today keep that business open for all of us. Thank you, Governor. Dr. Acton, good, uh, good quote from uh, Peggy Noonan, uh, former Reagan speechwriter. And uh, I know a lot of people sent me a, a copy of that uh, this, this, this weekend. Um, this is an exciting time as we open back up uh, retail. Uh, I would just again uh, say that we are all in this together. Uh, it is so important as we go through this period of time to keep the distance uh, six feet apart, uh, wear that mask as a matter of courtesy to the people who are serving you in the retail business. Uh, later on, uh, when the restaurants are open, uh, as a matter of courtesy to people who are serving you in, in the in the restaurant uh, as as well. So I would like now uh, see if the director is up. Um, Medicaid director Maureen Corcoran uh, is joining us via Skype. Uh, director, thank you very much for joining us. As I uh, indicated a moment ago to everyone, uh, in addition to your duties. Uh, as the director uh, in dealing with Medicaid every day, uh, some time ago we also asked you to kind of take on uh, the nursing homes and just want to, if you'll just kind of outline uh, what we've been doing uh, in regard uh, to the nursing homes, particularly in regard to the, the COVID-19. So, director, it's all, it's all yours. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Governor and Lieutenant Governor and Director Acton. So since the middle of March, we've been working with a team of about 15 people from across the Departments of Health and Medicaid and with our colleagues at the Department of Aging to focus on these particular issues as it affects those who are served in nursing homes in assisted living, as well as in some of our other congregate environments. And just to give us all a point of reference, we serve in Ohio, we serve about 70,000 Ohioans in nursing facilities, not just paid for by Medicaid where I work um, in my spare time, but all kinds of different um, homes and all kinds of different payer sources. So about 70,000 Ohioans in nursing homes and about 42,000 Ohioans who are in various kinds of assisted living environments. So just those two um, groups of very important Ohioans constitute almost 115,000 Ohioans in just those two kinds of living environments. And if we add then say about another 100,000 staff who staff in those various kinds of homes and apartment arrangements. Um, you know, there's about 215,000 Ohioans, staff and individuals who live there, who are served in, our, in the assisted living and nursing home environment. And part of why that's important as I begin to answer the governor's question is that we knew from the very earliest experience that COVID was going to be particularly difficult for those with certain kinds of healthcare conditions, as well as for those who were older and might have disabilities. And so from, you know, as I say, from the beginning of this back in mid-March, this very uh, um, talented and multidisciplinary team of people focused on these issues because we knew that while the hospital issues were very important and continue to be important so that everyone can get the kind of health care that they need, we also knew that this would be an area that would need special attention, not only during the initial phase of this, but really 
as I've said to uh, all the people that I work with, this is going to be an area where we're going to be paying particular attention probably through the time that we have a vaccine. So this is not uh, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon, and we're building structures and scaffolding to provide the kind of both clinical support as well as other support for the staff who work in these environments. So the most important component of this, and the governor mentioned it, what Ohio has done that is very, very different is in the midst of this public health crisis, which it is, um, the governor called on our hospitals and, and said to them, you are the backbone of our health care infrastructure in Ohio, and I need you to do something that has not typically been what we've called on you to do in the past. And that's brought about this new structure, as the governor's talked about, I know on a number of occasions about hospital zones and the kind of coordination that's occurring across the three different areas of the state with leadership from all of our hospitals and the hospital association um, and have made just some incredible um, changes and progress in terms of preparedness and, and finding out some of the best things um, that we need to know about the science as it's evolving in this, in this current um, crisis. Building on that, building on that infrastructure, is, a for, is, is our plan, our plan to support those in nursing homes and the staff, as well as assisted living and other kinds of congregate environments. And that is a plan that we refer to as a local collaboration with hospitals, local health departments and nursing facilities and other community providers. There was a, uh, the governor had a, 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 a teleconference um, in the uh, late part of April, so you know April 28th, very end of the month, and it was attended by more than 1,500 people, professionals from across nursing homes, health departments, hospitals, where this plan was discussed at length. And what's important about it is, as the governor mentioned, that we're partnering with nursing facilities and hospitals, but the, the community commitment is, the collaboration that is the foundation of Ohio's plan is a commitment to a local collaboration in building the health department, nursing facilities, and other congregate environments working with their local hospital. That's our foundation. I wanna say a little bit more about the details but it all stems from that fundamental set of relationships that have been building and underway, really, as I say, since early on in this, in this uh, epidemic. Some of the particular then aspects of this plan are the tools, as I think of them. The tools in our toolkit include things like um, significant regulatory relief that we put in place across a number of our departments to try to free up nursing homes and, and other providers from the kinds of things that are important for normal accountability. And uh, But in a time like this, it was more important to be devoting our extra time to those that we serve in nursing homes and other healthcare environments. Um, and that was things like in, improving telehealth so that even in a nursing home, for example, a provider could could call in additional assistance or medical consultation um, in order to see that people's needs were being met to the best way that we could do that. We also have had a great deal of work around um, clinical protocols and training. And why that's particularly important here in this environment is because of what we know about the clinical condition and the, the needs of individuals who are served in congregate environments in our nursing facilities and assisted living. So we've paid particular extra attention with physicians who work not only in hospitals, but directors of nursing and medical directors from nursing homes worked with us to come up with the best, most practical advice in order to assure the best clinical care for everyone served across Ohio. We've developed um, in that regard a toolkit uh, 
that's about 25, 30 pages with all kinds of additional tools and guidance uh, that looks at issues like personal protective equipment and different uh, kinds of circumstances or scenarios in the different living arrangements uh, to provide assistance to staff across the state. Um, and that uh, toolkit that was released in early April is being revised now and updated with best information from CDC. Because as you know, this continues to be a changing um, environment as we learn more about this, uh, about this uh, virus. In recent weeks, we've uh, been uh, making some changes to our testing policy, as the governor mentioned, and are now expanding our, our formal testing prioritization to be more aggressive in our work with nursing homes, assisted living, and other congregate environments. And that statewide strategy is intended to try to stop the virus whenever we uh, are aware of a circumstance or a concern and to be sure that we can surge in or, or bring in extra resources both to test as well as to uh, take into account the other kinds of tools in our toolkit like additional protective equipment and uh, that sort of additional staff assistance. We have individuals infection control strike teams. I won't go through all the details of that but in uh, I would say the vast majority of, of the incidence of uh, coronavirus in nursing homes, we've had a local infection control strike team where many representatives from the state departments talk with that, with that uh, provider organization, with their clinical staff, with the local health department to make sure that they have what they need to make sure not only in personal protective equipment, but staff, um, as well as kind of additional information about the needs, particularly, for example, if people uh, are developing more significant symptoms and need to go to the hospital, we don't want that to be something that's decided at the last minute and that there be chaos. So we've got, uh, got an example I want to tell you about briefly where it shows the importance of planning for these kinds of things ahead of time, knowing who to call, knowing where you can get the resources that you need. The last thing I want to mention among our, our the tools in our, in our uh, toolkit of um, our plan is we've developed uh, what are known as healthcare isolation centers. So these are particular nursing homes across the state who have, are, have stepped forward and said, we, we can and we will develop the additional expertise to be able to quarantine individuals um, in, in their, their either their own nursing home where they live or potentially some who may be being discharged from the hospital to provide the extra care that they may need that also enables us and if, if the nursing home has concern about someone coming back from the hospital, to have another alternative there. So those are just a couple of the key kinds of uh, components of our plan. And I want to then just give you a couple of examples of how that's worked. So, for example, um, we have uh, here in the central Ohio area a program known as PART, the post-acute regional rapid testing program where uh, a, a nursing facility administrator can call if they have have an event or a, a case of COVID, they can call uh, the, the uh, PART program uh, that's administered by one of our local providers here in this region of the state, has teams that are trained in how to swab people for the, the virus. They can go out to the home. They have the PPE that they need to do the testing and then can take the test to a lab. And the point of all that, just to illustrate the kind of innovation that people have come up with in this, in this crisis, is to understand that it's important to know how to do the testing properly, that they, the results be able to be gotten quickly to a lab in order to get the results back to the nursing home or the other congregate living environment as quickly as possible. And then also what we can't forget is that folks like the physicians and the, the nurses and the team that goes in to do the swabbing, they can also help provide additional 
guidance or technical assistance about how to handle a particular circumstance or what kind of cohorting or organization of care might be the best to help keep isolated those who may have the disease or may have been exposed to the virus from those who, who have not and who are, are not symptomatic. Um, another last example I, I want to give you is uh, from uh, an, an, uh, a particular provider up in Northeast Ohio that I talked with. Um, I got a call on a weekend. There was concern about whether they had enough um, protective equipment, and they had had uh, a number of, of COVID cases identified. Uh, when I talked with them, they had already been working with one of our hospital partners in Northeast Ohio, had had one of their staff who comes in, had gone through the entire facility with them and helped them to look at how their care was organized, how meals were being delivered. Uh, the hospital had one of their physicians who was rounding, physically rounding every day to be sure that those individuals in that nursing home were getting the best care. And I, I want to end with that because I want to tie back to something that Dr. Acton said. In this particular case, and this is true with a number of our nursing homes, where in an abundance of caution, we have done a large sample of tests, or in a couple of these cases, we've tested all of the residents of that nursing home. And invariably, the, the, the administrator will say to me, well, people see that I have a large number and they get concerned about the quality of care in my facility. And I wanna just underscore what Dr. Acton said. Many, many times we find that individuals are asymptomatic with this virus. Um, it has absolutely nothing to do with the quality of care. In fact, this particular nursing home that I was talking to was a five-star rated home, very highly regarded. And they had taken the initiative, they had had the, the outbreak of this in their home, all of the residents were tested, and so obviously their numbers were higher. So it's important that we understand what that means when we see those kinds of numbers and see it not as a bad thing, but in fact as a, a, a another evidence of the kind of openness um, that that um, is important to make sure that the loved ones who whose family members are there know what's going on and that all the resources and the attention is being given to the needs of people who live there. So with that, Governor, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Director, I think that's a, I think that's a very, very good point. I, one of my experiences in law enforcement, uh, particularly when I was the Attorney General, uh, was that uh, sometimes uh, you'd have a community and there's a lot of publicity about uh, drugs in the community. And people would start getting very concerned about that. And what I would tell people is, look, uh, they've got aggr aggressive uh, administration. Uh, they're not tolerating drugs, uh, so they're going out and they're going after it. And so because they have more cases does not mean that they have more drugs. It means they're being more more aggressive. And, and so I, I think that is similar uh, to sometimes what we see in nursing homes. And so, um, you know, your, your message that, you know, nursing homes being aggressive, uh, being uh, on top of the game, uh, sometimes may show up as more tests positive, but that should not be read as that the people there are getting not good care. That's not the message uh, that really should be sent at, at all. So I think that's a very, very, very good point. Um, I'm going to ask now uh, to Director McElroy to, to join us, if you could, about uh, something that to me I know is just heartbreaking for so many, many people. Uh, and it's heartbreaking to, to hear about it. And that is, you know, we issued the order uh, on March 14th, uh, which stopped visitation at nursing homes. Um, and that is just, um, I, I know for families, just very, very, very difficult. Um, some families had situations where, um, you know, a, a loved one has, has, has died. I love, they have not been able to be with that loved one as much as they would have wanted to be. Uh, so this, these are difficult things. And, you know, trying to figure out, you know, we, we don't want the COVID to spread. We know once it gets into a nursing home, it's tough. Uh, so the orders were issued with that in mind, with medical advice, 
uh, scientific advice that we ne needed to be very, very careful. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a human cost to that I as well. And I wonder if you two can maybe maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, I know, uh, Director McElroy, uh, you're going to talk a little bit uh, about a number of things, but you're going to talk about a new program uh, s called Staying Connected. Uh, but I wonder if you both could just kind of discuss, uh, you know, some of the challenges connected with that visitation not being allowed in nursing homes and, you know, things that maybe that we can do in regard to uh, enhancing the quality of life for the people who are in there and keeping them connected. So, uh, Director, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Absolutely, absolutely, Governor. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you, Director Corcoran, for the great work uh, that you're doing, and thanks to everyone watching uh, today, sir. Um, you bring up a really good point, uh, one that we are working through uh, each and every day, um, we are grateful for many of the protections that we've put in place, but we also appreciate the enormity of the issues. Uh, our protections that we put in place have also lended themselves at times to having disconnections, if you will, or not having the level of connection that we're typically accustomed to between our families uh, and our loved ones within the facilities. And, you know, one of the things that you have said to us that I hold close is that we can do two things at one time. We can certainly protect people, but we also have the ability through those protections to be able to keep people connected. And so that's what we're working on. How do we keep people connected during these times? I, along with you, I, I'm very familiar with the family members that have reached out um, intimately involved with individuals who have expressed their concerns. And so we are working with those families. Um, we are working with residents of nursing facilities. Uh, and we are working with people within the industry to be able to come up with the most appropriate solutions to be able to do those two things at one time, sir. Well, that, that's, that's great. Um... I don't know what our what's our capability? Are we going to be able to see both, both, put both of them up. Okay, that would be that would be great. We're going to split the screen here, see how how that works. Uh, Dr. Acton, questions or, or comments for either either of our our directors. Uh, same for you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Anyone anybody have questions? Um, I'll start if that's all right. I I just. You know, again, I know the workers have been going above and beyond, and I, too, we have family and friends who have gone through some of what you've been discussing. What other ideas, like what more could we do um, as citizens? What more can we do during this period? Um, and what kinds of things have you seen in your work out there that people are doing to be of help? I feel this, I feel compelled to take action in some way, and I'd beyond being the director of health, I just wanna know how it could be of more help. Um, we're doing everything we can with PPE, with good infectious disease control, but as a citizen, could I do more? Could philanthropy do more? Could our communities do more? So I think I'm hearing you, Dr. Acton. I think you're asking what, what are people doing and what more can people be doing? Am I hearing you? Am I hearing you correctly? Yes, yes. Yep, that that's it. <laughs> you got you got okay, the director. Okay, you got okay. the question right, absolutely, right on absolutely. it. <laughs> so, so if I if I may, I, I want to take a moment uh, to provide people with a sense of what's happening uh, throughout the aging network as it relates to older adults. Uh, you know, first I cannot state how appreciative I am and many families are for the great work that Director Corcoran. Dr. Acton have done around testing their teams. Uh, it has been critically important. But what I do know is that with every request, you know, every number, whether it's a request for personal protective equipment, whether it's a request for another test, um, there is a person attached to that. 
And I am acutely aware of what that means. Uh, there's a person uh, who may be a resident within a facility, but connected to that person is a family as well. And so there is deep appreciation for what that means. There's also the connection for the staff who are providing this care for this individual and on behalf of those families. And so, again, the enormity of this cannot be overstated. And so we're very locked into the social and emotional impact of, of COVID-19. I think there's a lot of emphasis, appropriately so, on being sure that we preserve life. But it is also equally important that we focus on the quality of the life that we are preserving. You know, we talk about these things, we think about these things uh, day in and day out as these decisions are being made, particularly as we are now responsibly restarting Ohio. Um, there is a desire and energy, right, uh, of an enthusiasm. People want to be connected. And, you know, there are, there are several things that we are doing right now that I want to talk about here today. And I also want people to appreciate, though, um, what families have had to sacrifice during this time. And, and, and when I mentioned time, it's really interesting because I thought about this actually this morning about time. You know, when we first started this, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, when we first started this, we knew that we had to move really fast. And so time was of the essence. We had to make really hard decisions. We were thoughtful, but we knew that we had to operate with a sense of urgency. But then I thought about how time may feel for family, particularly those who have not had the opportunity to go in and frequent the facilities like they're accustomed to. For them, it could feel as if time has stood still, as if time is dragging on. And so time is relative in the sense that how is it perceived for that person or that family? You know, I want people to know that we recognize the sacrifices you've had to make. Uh, we recognize how difficult it must be to not be able to see someone that you're used to seeing each and every day or every weekend, to not be there for some of those milestones. We appreciate what you are sacrificing right now. You know, we have put in place and we have worked with uh, many within the aging network to see if there are virtual capabilities. You know, not to suggest that a virtual option takes the place of a hug, right, a kiss. It doesn't. But it, at least it provides, right, We're, we, we believe it provides some level of connection. We also have our long-term care and budsman program. I want to remind people about this program. You know, if you have concerns, if you have questions, if you need answers about what's happening within that facility, you can contact our state long-term care and buds, and they stand ready. And I must tell you, we've been in constant conversation about what should their role look like as we begin to move forward and as this goes a bit longer. You know, we are poised to mobilize, keeping in mind we are balancing anything we do with safe practices, always touching in with our clinicians, right? And certainly being considered of the voices of the people who are impacted, that being you as the loved ones and the residents themselves. Director, director you, want, you, want, have, director, yeah, you want to yeah. I want to interrupt, but you wanna, I want to make sure you, you explain what the Staying Connected program uh, is and, and how that's going to work. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have our Staying Connected program. We're really excited about this. Today will be the launch. So when you reach out to us, this will be uh, you'll be one of the first uh, to sign up for our Staying Connected program. Uh, the purpose of the program is to add a bit of comfort to an older adult's day. Um, they will be checked on. So we knew that we had many people, not even just within facilities, but also within communities that because of the guidance that we provided and because of their own desire to keep themselves safe, uh, some of the connections that they're used to have been changed. Uh, they are not as often as frequent in the way that they're accustomed to. And so we want to be able to respond to those concerns. 
Uh, it is to provide reassurance to individuals who may feel isolated that they'll be checked on daily. It's to provide a simple way for older adults to connect to local supports if interested in doing so. So we'll call you up. You'll let us know you're okay. And, by the way, if you decide, hmm, I really need something, you can select an option, select that option, and we'll connect you with someone who can help you with the service. Maybe you need a meal. Maybe you need some information. But we'll provide that connection to you. And Director, then finally... Yeah, so, yes, so, so Director, this, this will be not just for people in nursing homes, though, right? This will be, this will be anybody. Correct. Okay. This, this is for the community. Uh, we recognize that isolation and a need for connection, while it is critically important to our residents within the facility, it is equally important to many of the older adults. And by the way, we have 2.8 million here in this state. We have the sixth largest in the nation who still need that sense of connection. So it is available to anyone who wants to give us a call, 60 years of age and older. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, we that was great. I think we better get to some questions. And so what we're going to do um, for everyone out there, direct uh, a question to the directors, or you can direct them to anybody else uh, up here. So we're ready to go for questions. Thank you, Governor Jim Otte from WHIO-TV. This is a question for Dr. Acton. And I want to go back to a statement you made yesterday about a discovery about some of the earliest cases that go back to January, actually. Dr. Atkin, what can you tell us about that investigation, the status of that into the earliest cases, like the one in Miami County that goes back to January 7th? What's the significance of that, finding out that that case came so early, and how could that help us in the future? So thank you, Jim. I, I think it's a fascinating next chapter in our understanding this disease. As I said all along, um, we'll learn a lot more in time um, and certainly looking back. And one of the things that's now, I, I talked about it being starlight, remember, and we're seeing a distant star and seeing it now. One of the things that antibody tests are doing is saying that at some point in time, someone had this disease. This isn't the test we do to see if you have it currently. And antibody tests, again, can be tricky. Um, sometimes, you know, I asked our team, you know, what are the predilections of this test? And they said, you know, sometimes people can have had another co coronavirus. So sometimes there are false positives. It's something we take into account. It also doesn't tell the exact time that a person had the disease. We just see that they had fought it off. But the epidemiologic investigation, our disease detectives, go back and they get the story. And they look back and see when was someone having those COVID-19 symptoms. And that's how we arrive at those dates in January. Now, it could be that someone had another virus then um, because we didn't have testing for it and you know, concurrent testing to tell them they had it. And it could be that they were asymptomatic when they actually had COVID. So we can't even, in getting that case you know, clinical diagnosis, say for sure that that's what they had. But if we look at enough of these um, and we look at it over time and we look at data that's arriving more and more that tells us that uh, this infection was here with us sooner, we look at some of the... Um, Influenza-like illness, uh, we had some samples that have been taken in labs that show that people who tested negative for flu might have, have had coronavirus then. And also some of the coroner reports. All of this is pointing to the fact that there may have been cases and spread a lot sooner than we realized in this country. Interestingly, of the six cases, um, and in going back, our epidemiologists tell us that two of them had travel histories, one to Hawaii, and one to California. And again, that starts to fit with a clinical, a bigger picture of the epidemiology of this disease. But again, Governor, it's always the tip of the iceberg. We're gonna learn more from these cases and many more to come, I think, as we see more widespread antibody testing and we learn more and more about the spread of this disease. Good afternoon, Governor Karen Johnson, WLWT in Cincinnati. With Memorial Day approaching, we are getting a lot of questions from our viewers about travel and swimming. There are still travel restrictions in place. 
Will those restrictions be lifted? Can families, are they free to maybe take a road trip to Lake Cumberland, Gatlinburg, Smoky Mountains? And also a lot of HOAs are asking, should they move forward with plans to reopen, reopen swimming pools this year? Uh, I know the Lieutenant Governor has been working on the swimming pool issue. Uh, we're not really ready to do that yet, but we'll be doing this, uh, we hope, on Thursday. Uh, as we look at a lot of different uh, summer summer activities, so we look forward to be doing that. Um, again, uh, you know, we're not ready to make any announcement in regard to travel. We've done this. We're trying to layer this out, and and, and frankly, we're trying to see um, you know one step or two steps or three steps at a time and see how how things are going. Uh, so, but we understand that people need to make plans. Um, summers about here and uh, you know we're certainly going to get that information uh, shortly. Good afternoon, Jeff Reddick from ABC6 News here in Columbus. Uh, both the governor and Dr. Acton, there are reports out now of a, uh, an undisclosed or unreleased White House report listing Columbus as one of eight cities in the United States that are cities to watch for a possible spike in COVID-19 cases. Are you able to say whether you're aware of that and how much of a spike would become a problem whereas certain parts of the state might be required to shut down again? Uh, I don't have any knowledge of that. I would just say that, um, you know, we have some great health departments across the state. Uh, Columbus has a great health department with a great, great leader uh, and, a, and a very, very strong mayor, and we've worked very closely with both of them um, in the last in the last two months. Dr. Acton, I don't know if you have anything on that. Yeah, you know, both um, Dr. Mashika Roberts and Director Joe Mazzola, two outstanding um, health departments here in Columbus, they've been working again tirelessly. I know I say that word a lot, but that's the truth. Um, they have great coalitions uh, working with their mayors, working with their county commissioners, and doing um, really outstanding public health work. I, I, I think we have to remember, and I know especially with questions about summer um, and you know the antsiness that we all feel, um, that we are in a plateaued state. Um, we are still, the virus is still with us, as the governor always says. It's, it's still a pretty treacherous time for us. So I think we have to remember that all of us have to double down on our efforts. And I, I say this to every one of you out there. It is, it's us. It's what we do. It's how careful we are will allow us to do more and more. But, you know, all over the world we're learning. And so we, we've got to be responsible as we go out. Um, it's still not a time to have these mass gatherings. It's still not a time. We really don't want to incite the spread of infection. So all the great things we saw, like the distance in line to wait, the wearing the mask in, you know, the doing, you know, it's not a time for great browse shopping. It's a time to go in and get the things you need and support businesses. But we have to move about carefully. Um, and we have to watch these numbers carefully because we know that many, many of our citizens are still you know, vulnerable to this, and, and we learn a lot about the disease every day. So, you know, I want everyone to do this and to get connected and do everything you can to get out there, but get out there very carefully, and we'll be watching um, these spikes. There's no magic number. We look for trends. We talk to our hospitals every day to see how they're doing with capacity, and it's numbers that we will share, and I think you'll see all the leaders around the country try to figure out the best steps we can make, and, and we'll learn this together. And just two additional comments. I mean, hospitalization numbers is what we look at every day. We also know that these hospitalization numbers are a lagging indicator. So that, you know, the infection obviously occurred, uh, you know, a few weeks before that. So, uh, but we're going to, we continue to monitor these numbers, uh, you know, every single day. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. It's Laura Bischoff, Dayton Daily News. Uh, there's a lot of talk about um, steps that we're taking to make people feel safer and to boost consumer confidence, um, yet we still can't seem to keep the coronavirus out of the White House. 
How can Ohioans know that the recommended protocols will keep the virus out of their local diners, cafes, bars, and coffee shops? Well, a lot of this is going to depend on what we all do. Um, there is no guarantee uh, that it can stay out of anywhere in Ohio. Uh, so I can't, I can't give that assurance at all. Uh, the virus is still here. It has not gone away. Uh, what we have tried to do uh, is come up with the best practices we can for restaurants, the best practice we can for retail in general, the best practice um, for every for uh, cutting hair. Uh, but that does not mean that that's going to absolutely guarantee a, a protection. Um, what we can do as we go through this coronavirus uh, is, is those activities that we do engage in, we can engage in a way that is as safe as humanly possible to make it. We also uh, can decide as individuals based on our medical condition and based upon our age which activities to engage in at all. And those are two, two, different, two different things. Uh, but uh, the social distancing be, be wearing a mask uh, is just so very, very, very important. Uh, and so what we can do by our behavior, uh, each and every one of us, uh, is impact the odds. Uh, life is not, life has risk. The coronavirus presents a special risk, a dangerous risk, an unusual risk. Um, but we can deal with that in, a, in as safe a way as, as, as possible. And so when people go into a restaurant, what they can be assured is that, or they go into any retail, the rules are in place. And when that business is following those rules, that they are as safe as they can be under that, circum, under that circumstance. Governor Fran, say yes to uh, going out to uh, a restaurant. There should not be shame in this. Um, I, I really want to resist the shaming of us judging each other during this. And there will be cases, and there will be cases in businesses. And it's much more important that we're honest and we ask for help. That's why I say our local health departments are standing by not to judge, but to come in and help. So you might do everything right as a business and you'll have an employee get sick. And the most important thing we can do is, first of all, as an employee, to be honest that you're sick and tell, tell that and talk to your doctor and we gotta get you help. And also, if you're a business, if you see something, you need help, ask for it. Again, it's all of us working together that will solve this. We're all gonna learn together. And so I, I just, I can't say enough that we really, we really need to work together and ask for help. And on our website, coronavirus.ohio.gov, if you never knew how to get your local health department, you'll find them there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, Governor, is, did Fran say yes to going out to a restaurant anytime soon? Uh, no yes yet, but I'm enjoying her cooking a lot, so, but we'll see. Hi, Governor. This is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. My question today is for the Lieutenant Governor. With things reopening, we're wondering if there are any metrics on economic loss from these month-long shutdowns, and are there any projections of when we'll recover? Well, we certainly know the unemployment numbers. Uh, the national unemployment rate was 14.7% during the last uh, report. We'll have a new one on Thursday. Uh, they're only expected to climb. Uh, it, nationally, uh, it's estimated by the end of the month it could end up being as high as 20%. Uh, the second quarter of this year is expected to be uh, one of the worst quarters on record. Uh, however, uh, once we begin the process of recovering, things start opening up, the global economy begins to recover, the national economy begins to recover, we could see an uptick uh, in the economy in the third quarter and in the fourth quarter. So we, what we can't know yet is just how long the effects 
of, uh, of the aftermath of the coronavirus will be, how long it will be, continue to be a threat in our lives, which all of those things will dictate the future. One of the things that we do know is a lagging part of the recovery is hiring people. Uh, that's always the case because employers need to feel confident of their financial situation before they begin the process of bringing people back to work. So we know that hiring will be a slower process. It always is. Uh, and so it will, it will take quite a while uh, to recover from this economically. Uh, we, we look at this from a budgetary point of view, and we know it will have an impact on our budget through 2020 and beyond. So, uh, but we only can take this step by step. We can't worry about the third quarter or the fourth quarter. What we have to worry about now is the smart reopening of businesses where you keep people safe, where you build employee and consumer confidence, uh, where we uh, stabilize these businesses from an economic point of view. Uh, so that they can begin to recover, so that finances can be in financing and, and liquidity can be worked out, cash flow. Uh, and then once that stability returns, then the hiring will return. Uh, it is a slow process. It will be a slow process. We just need to get first things first. Let's do the health things right. Let's get the protocols right. Let's begin, uh, continue the staged reopening. And, and as people build confidence, uh, more of them will go back to work, more of them will begin to spend, uh, and then the economy will recover. Jack Windsor. Question, uh, I didn't give her a complete answer, uh, but Laura, Fran and I were talking the other day about going over to the Melody restaurant uh, and getting some fried chicken and uh, maybe even bringing some back for uh, so some of our, some of our kids and, and grandkids uh, run by my buddy Woody. So we we're thinking of thinking of that fried chicken the other day. So maybe in the next few days we'll we'll go over to Clark County and get that. Jack Windsor, WMFD TV, Mansfield. Question for Governor Dewine. Uh, Governor, Ohio has issued pandemic operation certifications to child care facilities since your restrictions began. Uh, these facilities care for kids of workers in health care, first response, and parents who work at Walmart. There have been no outbreaks and no hot spots. A couple other key points, uh, pandemic certification is available now. Again, uh, no outbreaks or hot spots. And this virus was here in January, if not sooner, which may point to immunity among kids since the number of children infected is reportedly low. My question, sir, what direct evidence do you have to delay opening child care facilities now and letting more parents get back to work? Well, that, good question. Uh, and we're going to have that shortly. But uh, as I said yesterday, uh, it's very important for us to get this right. Data in regard to um, <clears throat> child care uh, is different uh, and it's difficult. And here's, here's why it's difficult. Um, the real threat, uh, we believe, although we certainly have seen in the news in the last 48 hours some kind of gut-wrenching stories nationwide about kids being impacted. But we do know that statistically kids are not impacted nearly as much as uh, older, older people are. Um, and, but the real concern always with child care is that you're mixing a bunch of families and these kids, social distancing is pretty hard for a two-year-old, three-year-old, um, and they go back home. And they, one of them has come in. They're not showing symptoms. They don't have the temperature, so they're not excluded. But they're carrying it, and then they spread it, and then it goes back to 10 families or 20 families or however many families that child has come in, in contact with. So those numbers, while you may not see hot spots, uh, you may see significant spread. Uh, it's the reason that you close schools. It's the reason that we, we closed uh, the, the, the daycare down. Uh, so that is really what the concern. And so the data is just very, very hard, hard to get. Uh, I don't, Dr. Acton, if you want to add anything from a medical point of view, anything yeah. else to that? I know we're going to be talking about child care in the next day or two. Um, it's something that we've really been spending a lot of time in the policy there's studies, you know, from around the world. Um, there is 
studies from China that said the rate of transmission was a third as much, but then studies from Germany really did show a risk. We know um, children, the, the predominant from the Princess uh, Diamond, the cruise ship, was that kids were at least catching it as much as their adult counterparts. But the, the question also is, you know, something of concern lately has been, you know, the Kawasaki-like disease. Uh, it's something all our children's hospitals are taking a look at now. Um, and, and so we're watching this very closely. Uh, the National Institutes of Health have just started a study called the HERO study, where they're going to be looking at families and how it spreads through kids and families. We have had cases in child care, actually, um, cases both in, in kids and also in um, the workers there. Um, but we have not seen a widespread spill over into the community. Um, but, it, but it's something that's very important because if we are going back to work, you know, parents need child care to be able to do that. And we know there are some consequences of kids not having a safe place to go. We're looking at the same issues around summer camp programs. So like everything else we've done, it's been looking at difficult options sometimes and weighing those, those risks. But uh, I can tell you it's something we're looking at very closely and we'll be sharing more information soon. One hopeful thing is that we are gonna study it. Um, we are gonna study our child cares here in Ohio and learn more about the spread of this disease. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, and, Governor. Ann Rowley had actually studied that and said that um, that was anecdotal, that there was no link between COVID-19 and Kawasaki. Um, are you aware of that finding? Oh, I'm sorry. I am not aware of that finding. Um, I think that the science is not at all yet clear. We know it is a, we know with um, COVID, and I say this to people of all ages out there, um, we began this journey thinking of it very much as a lung disease, but as we learn more and more, and as Dr. Fauci just testified today to Congress, um, we were learning more about its impact as an inflammatory disease. And we all fight off diseases and produce an inflammatory response. Um, we're trying to understand one of the things that we think kids might be less susceptible is because it has to do with damage to blood vessels. And obviously those of us who have lived longer have had more inherent damage, but um, the out of control immune response, we're seeing heart attacks, strokes, and kidney disease. And um, what Kawasaki's is as actually a, a, a disease that has an inflammatory response with damage to um, blood vessels. We're also seeing stories about COVID toes and fingers. So we're seeing this inflammatory response and I think there's a lot more we yet have to learn about it. Thank you. Marty Schladen, Ohio Capital Journal. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, we are reopening and as far as I can tell, we haven't met the CDC gating criteria either in terms of case trends or testing. And Dr. Acton just mentioned uh, Dr. Fauci's testimony before Congress today. And he said, I feel that if this occurs, there's a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak you may not be able to control, which in fact, paradoxically, would set you back, not only leading to some suffering and death that could have been avoided, but even set you back on the road to try to get to economic recovery. Uh, what's your response to that? Well, I, there are very few states that actually can meet those requirements. Um, we believe that we, if we do this right, um, you know, we can do two things at once and that we can focus on health and we can at the same time focus on trying to carefully uh, get our economy back. But uh, you are correct and he is correct. Uh, it is a risk. It is also a risk whatever we do. It is a risk if we don't do anything. It's a risk if we don't try to open back up. Uh, the other risk is that there are real medical, uh, there are real health risks as well as economic risk uh, when we have a, an economy that is as far down as this economy is. Um, you know, we, we see all kinds of things historically that, that happen. Uh, that are not that are not good, um, 
also we impact, of course, the long-term ability of us to provide help uh, and assistance to people uh, in, the, in the medical area uh, and in, in other areas. So it's a balance. It's not an easy balance. Um, we sh do not underestimate the risk. Um, and so that is why every single day, um, and I'm sure people are tired of me saying this, but we have to do this right. You know, w when you go into a store and everyone's got a mask in there who works there, please, please do the same thing. Bring some facial covering. Uh, keep, keep your social distance. Uh, you know, look, I know the weather is great. Uh, I saw pictures uh, th this morning uh, of, of a place in Ohio where people were gathered together and very, very close, and it looked like they were having a great time, but they had to be spreading it um, because we have so many people who do not have show the symptoms. Uh, and so what Dr. Acton and every medical expert I've talked to says is that you have to assume that everyone has it or everyone has the ability to spread it. And if you do that, you will keep your distance, um, uh, wear the mask, and you will r reduce um, the risk. So, yeah, it's a risk. And as we move forward, if we do what we need to do, uh, and everyone does that, uh, then we can do two things at once. If people do not do that, uh, then we cannot do it. Uh, I, you know, I'm optimistic. Ohioans have been great about this, but we got to keep doing it. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. We are in this for the long run, uh, and this, this virus is still very, very much with us. So um, it's a risk whatever we do. Uh, I have confidence in Ohioans that we can, we can get this done. Hello, uh, Andrew Welsh Huggins with the Associated Press. Uh, I think this question is for Dr. Acton. Um, this has to do with the nursing home data, and I want to make sure I understood correctly. Are the numbers we've been reporting on nursing home deaths and cases as a percentage of the total seem totally different. So I want to make sure I understood that you said nursing home deaths make up 22% of overall deaths and 16% of cases? That is the number that I received today of the current breakdown, um, that long-term care residents are about 16% of cases and 22% of deaths. But you'll double check me on that and I'll, I'll double check as well with my team. But that's the numbers I was given today. A number of us reported earlier this week or last week that there's been 497 nursing home deaths since April 15th, which that alone is 41% of the current uh, overall uh, numbers of death, and apparently the data is not available before April 15th, so it would seem to be actually much, much higher if, if we factored in that, uh, the previous uh, data. So I, I'm just hoping we can clarify this because the numbers seem very, very high I'll from our that reading. For you. I do have that the total deaths are 499, but I do think one of the things that we've been seeing is that the reporting mechanism, mechanism is new. I know since we've been doing the Wednesday updates, there's been some discrepancies in those numbers. So I will definitely have my team double check the math on that. Thank you. Hello, Governor. Uh, this question for Dr. Acton also. Um, and by the way, happy late Mother's Day, Dr. Acton. Uh, the human body was built to take uh, the proper amount of oxygen to function. Now with this mask, we are we breathing our own air and it's something that um, has side effects. And there's people working in line and they have a long term standing up with a mask and we heard about some dizziness in, in, in that proper thing. Is any side effects, long-term side effects or short-term side effects after all this long-term uses a mask or is covering your mouth is good enough? So it's very important um, to recognize that these are, these are very new studies, but there's a lot of evidence now 
um, to support the use of these masks, but not everyone can wear them. There are folks, just like you're saying, that have health conditions that make wearing it more difficult. It's one of those things, and again, I, I fear for someone like that who's being judged maybe for not wearing a mask when they might have a very good reason, but they'll want to be cautious and be even more careful about protecting other people. But what this largely does is keep droplets um, from getting out into the air. Now, I would suggest, you know, doctors and nurses wear these on all shifts, and when you gear up in PPE, as you saw, especially in some of the scenes from New York City of the healthcare workers, it's not comfortable. It's very exhausting, it's very hot. I see you wearing your mask now. Um, I think it's important to take breaks. You, you want to wear it over your nose and mouth, both. You don't want to wear it below. And we have tips on our website about this. Um, but even myself, I'll find sometimes I leave the open end on the bottom sometimes to get a little extra air in as well. So I think we're all trying to learn how to use these. There are people, especially really small kids, um, you have to definitely think about this as a risk um, for a small child. So that's something parents, and we're getting tips out on that as well. But for most of us, we can learn to wear these comfortably. And if you're like me, um, you take some breaks where you go places or go outside and take it off or you know, in the car, someplace that you know you're not going to be putting someone else at risk. So, um, but I do want to say that um, it shouldn't be so tight you know, that like you're, what you're talking about is breathing in your own carbon dioxide. And so if anyone was feeling uncomfortable, I think they need to step away and, 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 and take it off. Thank you. Hello, this is Laura. <laughs> I haven't said anything about it. What, I was so moved by the governor talking about um, his parents and his mom and Fran's mom and, grand, and her, her uh, mother and grandmother. Um, I want to say on Mother's Day, it was a day I did do some reflecting. And I just want to say a shout out to the women. Um, this has been an issue. Women are often on the front lines of a lot of the jobs we're talking about. Um, I've seen so many pictures of women and dads too, but it really stood out to me this Mother's Day of women who are the nurses and the doctors and the nursing home workers and the child care workers and, and um, just sort of the ingenuity. You saw two of my colleagues here. Um, they're the doers who are sitting there with a kid on their knee and also trying to work and also be a teacher now. And so I just want to shout out to all the moms, I thought about you this Mother's Day. This is Laura Hancock from cleveland.com. I have a, a question for Director Corcoran, if she's still on. Is she still on? Um, We're getting her right back up. OK, so. thanks. She's. OK, hello. <laughs> um, I, I just have a question. This is Laura from cleveland.com. Um, what are Medicaid rules right now? And like, what's the number? And then also, with the increased Medicaid patients, do you anticipate still being on target for work requirements? Director, could you hear that? Were you able to hear the question? Uh, first one was about the med what are the Medicaid roles right now? Oh, we got to pull. We got to pull the director up here. All right, we are not getting the director's audio, unfortunately. Okay, we're 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 gonna, if you could hold, that was the first question, the Medicaid rolls, and what was the second question? They on target and on track to do work requirements next year. Um, we're gonna we're gonna wait until we see if we can pull her up, uh, and we'll hold on that question, and we'll we'll take the next question. And then uh, next questioner, and then we'll come back and we'll try to get the director back up. We apologize for that. Chris from 10TV. Um, many are wondering, you know, bars and restaurants are going to be opening this Friday. 
but not gyms. The group, the 1851 Center for Constitutional Law, announced a lawsuit today on behalf of 35 gyms across the state to get gyms back open. What is your response to that lawsuit, and what do you have to say to those gym owners? Well, we have gym owners who are on a working group um, that are going to come up with a recommendation uh, very, very shortly. Uh, so what we want to do is do this right. We want to make sure that the people who run gyms, at least a representative sample uh, of those individuals, are directly involved in, in making this decision. As far as the lawsuit, I get sued a lot, um, and I, I leave this up to uh, the, the Attorney General's office, David Yost, who is, who is uh, the lawyer for the governor, and so I let them worry about the lawsuits. So these, these occur quite, quite frequently as part of the job. And we're going to go. Uh, Director, were you able to hear the question? Yes, Governor. Thank you, um, and thank you, Laura. So uh, the current um, number of individuals on Medicaid is now just about 3 million. Um, we had an increase in the number of people by about 140,000 from the end of April, excuse me, the end of March until the end of April. And I think the other part of your question was about work requirements. And uh, the... Uh, what I want to say to you is, first of all, you're making me do both my jobs in one day. I have to do my nursing job and my Medicaid job. So you're tasking both sides of my brain. So on the other part of your question about the work requirements, we are fully committed to implementing the work requirements. And as you know, the governor has been very clear about us doing it and doing it right. So we'll be in continuing discussion with CMS as we are now around implementation to be monitoring not only what's happening here, but what's happening with the unemployment rate um, and how it'll affect our implementation. But we're fully committed to going forward. Thanks, Director. Thank you very much. That was our last question. If I could give um, just the quick statistic. Um, to the answer about nursing homes, it is 22% of the total long-term care COVID cases. So that's 869 out of 3,942. So the 22% is out of all long-term care cases, how many have died. But not, but not out of the total, total cases. Not out of the total cases. So I Okay, and we can probably get the figure out of the total cases yeah. for next time, so. Thank you. All right. Um, over the past several months, we've featured performances from professional collegiate uh, choirs during these briefings. We recently received a video performance by the children from the Worthington Hills Elementary 6th grade choir. Uh, the director had each of the children record themselves singing at home and then put it all together. Uh, so we're going to end today uh, with their recording of Seasons of Love from the musical Rent. Uh, the lyrics ask, how do you measure a year? The answer then comes, measure in love.
Thanks to Worthington. We will see you not tomorrow, but we will see you Thursday uh, at 2 o'clock. Have a good day. Thanks a lot.